Uh, all right. Hello, everyone. I'm Richard, or Ducky, Quack. Um, quack, Quack. It's always great to have a bit of interactivity. Um, anyways, I am currently a postdoc at the University of California, Los Angeles, and I work on this odd intersection of programming languages, human-computer interaction, and electrical engineering. So I like building things. And being able to do custom electronics opens up so many exciting capabilities. I should put an FPGA in this duck. Does not have one yet. Soon. Um, and while there are great open source tools like KiCad, uh, redrawing variations of the same circuit all the time gets pretty tiring. So today, I'll be discussing stealing great ideas from software engineering and adapting library-based designs to PCBs. So let's get right into it. It works. Hurrah. Um, so the thing about modern software development is that it's very productive. If I wanted to generate a QR code for types of duck, as one does, these six lines of Python are really all I need. And there's no magical AI or anything behind this. This is just pretty straightforward library-based design. Um, I'm basically building upon the work of all the people who have built this very nice QR code library and made it easy to use, as is the spirit of open source development. But we don't really see this in hardware land. Um, for example, if we were building a mechanical keyboard, like this guy right here, we'd probably build a schematic from the ground up. Like, sure, we might reference open source schematics, but it's not like Python, where I can just directly import um, libraries. Now, even though in concept, there is a good deal of modularity in schematics with reusable blocks like microcontroller um, and the switch matrix, right? But in practice, um, these details need to be customized for each application. So, you know, that's a two by two. What if I want a three by three? Right, and while current schematic tools don't support this, I think we can steal great ideas from software engineering to enable these libraries of parts and ultimately, ultimately make hardware engineering more productive and fun. So since that's a bit abstract, I'll show this idea in actual with a demo, and I really hope the video will eventually work. Um, so since we're borrowing many concepts from programming, the whole system is a hardware description language. So you can think of it as a way to define a schematic using similar ideas of blocks and wires, but defined in text, and importantly, with the full power of a programming language behind it. If you're familiar with FPGAs or chip design, this is kind of like Verilog, except more powerful and it doesn't suck. Um, so anyways, so starting from this blank template board, we'll build that 3 by 3 mechanical keyboard in three minutes. Oh my gosh, it works. Um, so at the heart of a keyboard is a microcontroller. So we can start by adding the common STM32F103. And then I can instantiate the key matrix. So let's ask for a 3 by 3 macro pad. Now, if I build this design, um, I can see the blocks and their ports. And then, give a moment, I can connect them using these connect statements. It's going to take a while as I don't actually type it out. I think it's going to work. Yep. And then all, everything shows up when I rebuild. Um, now, the block diagram, there's a bit of red on it. It's telling me I need power and ground. So I can also add this USB port, um, connect the data lines and the power lines. And once I finish typing, I can once again rebuild it. And the ports are good. Well, once it rebuilds, yes. Um, but I still have an error. So here, it's telling me I have over voltage, because unfortunately, if you plug 5 volts into your STM32, it's not going to be very happy. So you can start by disconnecting the power line and rebuild. Um, so now I want a regulator. But instead of writing code, I can also search the libraries for blocks by category. And I'll choose the LD1117. I can insert it graphically. So like with the switch matrix, this is a parameterized block. Um, here, I'll ask for 3.3 volts out with, let's say, 5% tolerance. Um, give it a moment. Did it die? Nope, there we go. Um, so I can also hook up the power and ground connections graphically. And once again, I'm just going to hook that up. I can rebuild. Um, it's going to spin for a moment. And hey, zero errors. We like zero errors, right? It's also generated a bill of materials and a netlist, because that's also nice. 
Um, and then in KiCad, I can import the netlist. All my components show up as expected. You know, this is obviously a bit of a mess, um, but I can start by selecting subblocks because we do generate proper hierarchical data. I can move them around, break things up, and then work on them individually. And from here, it's largely a layout problem to get to a fabrication-ready board. Very cool. I'm, uh... All right, now if I hit the next slide, hopefully I'll go to the next slide. Yes, woohoo. So, you know, that probably went by just a bit fast. So let's kind of break down what happened. So each line of code here is analogous to something we do in schematics. This could be instantiating the block for the microcontroller and switch matrix, or connecting reports like for the two power lines. And this design forms that block diagram which is probably a pretty reasonable high-level design of a keyboard with the major blocks of microcontroller and switch matrix. Okay. And since each of these blocks is defined within the library, I'm saving a lot of time by directly reusing those subcircuits instead of rebuilding them from scratch or copy-pasting reference schematics. And blocks can be pretty complex, like that switch matrix over there doesn't look like fun, right? Um, but that's just a parameterized generator. So that defines or creates the subcircuit based on the user specified number of rows and columns. This structure is recursive all the way down. So you know that switch matrix itself is also just a sub block diagram. Um, and the diode inside it is another library block. And this one contains logic to select the parts from a parts table, um, accounting for common design constraints like voltage and current ratings. And at this lowest level, each of these blocks have an associated footprint. Um, this includes pin mapping, so you know, no more um, accidentally the whole pin mapping because I've been there, spent hours of my life debugging that. Wasn't fun. Don't be me. Um, and this whole nested hierarchy structure then gets flattened down into a netlist that, as we saw before, gets inserted into KiCad. And just like the Python QR code example, there isn't any magic here. It's all pretty straightforward library composition, but it's a powerful way to do design. And this enables us to put together the mechanical keyboard circuit in three minutes and a couple of lines of code. What? Uh, I might have accidentally, yeah, here we go. Okay, so with a bit of intuition from that example, I'll go a bit deeper into the core ideas that make all of this work. So overall, again, it's a Python-embedded domain-specific language. So the entire design is Python code to construct a circuit, with Python constructs corresponding to circuit constructs. So for example, classes represent schematic sheets, objects represent components and hierarchy blocks, and then we can compose um, all these in the framework of a general programming language, enabling this arbitrary logic for circuit construction. And this whole thing is based on the concept of hierarchical design, where we have blocks that hierarchically contain other blocks recursively. Um, and this allows us to use these very high-level intuitive blocks like microcontroller and voltage regulator without worrying about the details of individual resistors and capacitors. Um, and these blocks provide an encapsulation boundary, so that separates the usage view from the implementation details. So here we would be able to instantiate and connect up that library switch matrix nasty circuit without understanding the details of its implementation. And beyond what's possible with hierarchy sheets in KiCad, we have generators. So as blocks are defined the same way as the top level circuit, we can use the full power of Python to generate the circuit. Um, so for example, this switch matrix, it's got this nice for loop right here to create and connect switches based on the number of rows and columns. And this also extends to arbitrary calculations, for example, sizing components in a switching converter based on the input and target output voltages. I just I think this is double clicking somewhere. This is definitely double clicking somewhere. Um, it? 
Okay, please don't double click anymore. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and it's the user-defined libraries that are the most important part. So it's definitely not where it needs to be. Um, here we go. And it's the user-defined libraries that are the most important part. So while designing PCBs using high-level blocks is not a new concept, uh, some recent commercial tools don't support user-defined libraries, and that ultimately limits scalability. And in contrast, our goal is to go beyond these walled gardens and towards a large-scale, community-driven development scene in software. And one additional thing generators enable is uh, automatic, automatic correctness checks. So for example, the switch matrix generator, um, it generates a sub-circuit based on the rows and columns. Um, and then the number of IO needed is automatically propagated to the microcontroller, which allocates the pins needed. Um, the Type-C connector, um, as another example, also inserts the CC pull-down resistors that are so easy to forget. Once again, true mistake, don't be me. And the last piece that makes library-based design practical is a type system of components. So one reason why it's so difficult to directly reuse community schematics is because they have made many different choices in component selections. So maybe, there's a design you want to use that has Zofro 02 instead of through hole, um, but if you wanted to customize it, you basically have to directly edit the schematic. Um, so instead of directly specifying components, um, we have a type system that includes an abstract parts like generic resistors. And con concrete subtypes like surface mount and through hole resistors implement these interfaces and can be substituted in. Um, a board-wide refinement control system then specifies which subtypes are substituted in, allowing the system designer control while still being able to directly drop in and reuse libraries. This also works for sub-circuits like voltage regulators and even microcontrollers. And beyond supporting libraries, this idea of interchangeable parts also allows us to automatically compare different implementations like choices of diode and microcontroller, and even optimize for objectives like cost and performance. There's also an electronics model to support automated checks. So voltages, currents, limits, IO threshold. It's a pretty simple static model, but it helps automate a lot of common checks. And overall, though, there's nothing that ties this to any specific application. It's a pretty general framework for electronics design that hopefully makes design easier and more fun. Although we actually haven't built the keyboard example yet, we actually have built many other boards over the years. So um, this is a this thing I have right here. It's a Internet of Things LED matrix. That's probably the closest to the keyboard. You can, if you bring up your Wi-Fi, you can probably see it. Um, good luck connecting to it. There's like a magic IP address. Um, but anyways, what it has is this parameterized uh, LED matrix block. And what it does is it generates this pretty complex and even more nasty Charlie Plexing circuit, which can drive 30 LEDs with just seven IOs. And below that, um, the resistors and capacitors also uh, automates away the mundane part selection work. This also scales up to more complex examples. So for example, this Bluetooth stick multimeter. Um, while the analog front end is kind of specialized, library-based design allows us to reuse subcircuits like the MUX tree generator and the boost converter. We've also built a bunch more boards because building boards is fun. Um, that includes power converters, robot controllers, but I'm not going to go over them right now. So overall, this entire system, including the core language and compiler and the block diagram IDE are all open source, as would make sense for being here. <laughs> and while development has happened in the open for many years, um, this is actually the first talk of a more general audience and with what might be a quote unquote proper release, maybe. Um, but yeah, if you want to try it, we actually have a full tutorial, including a getting started guide. It's been tested on Windows, Mac, Linux. Really, it should run anywhere where there's Python and Java. Um, there will also be a QR code on the last slide, so you don't need to furiously copy things down. Um, now, that being said, there is a degree of polish on it, and there is a reasonable set of library parts, but I'm going to be honest that it's not going to be able to do everything just yet. And as a researching project, there's definitely bigger open questions too. 
So the theme of this talk was stealing great ideas from software engineering, but it's worth thinking where hardware differs substantially and the ideas don't translate over. For example, while iteration is near free in software, spinning boards decidedly is not. So maybe things like library quality and trust becomes more important. So maybe we can't have things like left pad for PCBs. On a more infrastructural level, our vision of PCB libraries depend on standard interfaces, including abstract parts like resistors and diodes and their models of resistance and voltage ratings. Questions include like, you know, when are these good enough for most applications without becoming overkill? And maybe more importantly, how can they evolve? And really the biggest idea here of library-based PCB design, um, like we see in the software community, um, this absolutely depends on community participation. So my hope is that as we see more interest in better ways to design PCBs, it will be based on open source platforms driven by large scale community collaboration, like the incredible successes we see in software, where we can enable anyone with the interest to build their devices easily and quickly. And towards that goal, if you'd like to build boards um, like these in an easier way than schematic tools, or if you're interested in the larger idea of community-driven sharing, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I'd definitely be interested in learning how library-based design could help your projects and workflows. So, you know, if you're here, please find me in the hallways and I'll also be on Discord, or you can always email me here. Quack. Quack.